This sermon was preached at Jerseyville Baptist Church on February the 4th, 2024. It is entitled, The Lord's Day, and it is the fourth sermon in our series on the Ten Commandments. For our first scripture reading, I will read Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 through 8. This is what the Lord says, Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps their hands from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name. Better than sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Amen. And before the preaching of the word, I'm going to read Uh, two passages. The first one is from Exodus, Exodus 31, verses 12 through 18. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. Those who do any work on that day must be cut off from the people. For six days' work is to be done, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Amen. And as a final passage, I will read from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 23, down to chapter 3, verse 6. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some of the heads of grain. The Pharisee said to him, Look! Why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath to do, good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And then there were nine. That is the title of a book on the Ten Commandments. The author wonders why, in practice, one of the commandments does not seem to have withstood the test of time for many of God's people, as the other nine have. The commandment, about which there is most debate and division, 
is the one we come to this morning in our studies on the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment, the Sabbath command. How one observes or does not observe the Sabbath or the Lord's Day today reveals how they handle the scripture in general. One of the big questions of understanding, interpreting, and applying the Bible is how does the Old Testament relate to the New Testament? How much continuity is there? In what way are things different? How are the commands and expectations of the Old Testament to be practiced in light of what is revealed in the New Testament? And the Sabbath is one of the major test cases. How one applies the Sabbath flows from how they view the overarching story of the scripture, how the pieces are put together. Another test case is baptism. The foundation for the different views on baptism flow from how we see the relationship between the old and the new. To understand how the two testaments relate, we do well to listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus says that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. Therefore, the law does have relevance today. There is a degree of continuity. In addition, Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So the question that we need to ask is, how does Jesus fulfill the law? What does it look like that Jesus fulfills the law? Because of the teaching, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, there will be changes. There is a new covenant. How does Jesus fulfill the specific law and teachings about the Sabbath? And that is what we are going to wrestle with today. And we are going to do so by looking at four points. And our first point is the Sabbath command. What is the Sabbath? Where did it come from? And though the word Sabbath is not used in Genesis 1 and 2, the pattern is there. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. Then he rested on the seventh day. He did not rest because he was weary or tired. His rest flowed from the accomplishment of the work of creation. It was finished. When Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt, God gave them manna to eat in the wilderness. They were instructed to collect double on the sixth day, for none would be provided on the seventh day, for it was the Sabbath. They understood, they learned that the Sabbath was important, but not many details were recorded about what keeping the Sabbath involved until the Israelites came to Mount Sinai. And the requirement to keep the Sabbath is enshrined as the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. On the Sabbath day, the last day of the week, they are to do no work. They are not to compel anyone else, even their animals or foreigners dwelling among them, to work. It is to be a completely different day for the entire nation. It is a day of rest. And why are they to keep it? Well, the next verse, verse 11 in Exodus 20, gives us the first reason. The text continues, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. When they observe the Sabbath, they are following the creation pattern. God created everything in six days and rested on the seventh. They are to work for six days, and then on the seventh, they too are to rest. And when they do so, they are reminded that God is their creator. God is the creator of everything. And they are part of his creation. God is the one who created them, and he is the one who sustains them. 
Their ongoing life is dependent on the mercy and goodness of God. That is what they are reminded of week in and week out as they celebrate the Sabbath. Remembering the Sabbath is a guard against the human bent to independence, to living as if God does not exist, because it is a weekly reminder that God is the creator and they need God. The rest that they are to do on the Sabbath is not just an absence of work, but it is to be a time of spiritual rest and refreshment. They are to reflect on who God is and what it means to be in a relationship with him. They are to be intentional in setting aside regular times of worship and devotion to God. They are God's covenant people, and so they are to foster a relationship with him. And the Sabbath provides them the opportunity, the weekly opportunity, to do that. In addition, for those who had eyes to see, the Sabbath pattern also foreshadowed a future rest that God had prepared for his people. The Sabbath comes at the end of the week because at the end of history, there will be God's perfect rest. Creation is heading in a direction. It is a story that is moving towards the culmination of rest, God's perfect eternal Sabbath rest, which will be enjoyed by his people. The Sabbath reminded them of the pattern of creation and was designed to give them physical rest and to focus their hearts and thoughts upon the Creator God. But there's also another reason given in the scriptures why they are to keep the Sabbath. The Ten Commandments are recorded twice, Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. They are given once just after the people have left Egypt when they are camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. And then the commandments are repeated after the wilderness wanderings, just before the nation is going to enter the promised land. And the reason for the Sabbath command in Deuteronomy 5 is different than that in Exodus 20. But let's start our reading with Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 14. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest, as you do. So far, the text in Deuteronomy is essentially the same as that in Exodus. There are differences in wording, but the expectation is the same. However, then we read, Deuteronomy 5.15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. In Exodus chapter 20, they were told to keep the Sabbath to remind them of creation. Now here in Deuteronomy 5, they are told to keep the Sabbath to remind them of the Exodus. And there is no conflict here. There are simply two reasons given in the scriptures for them to keep the Sabbath. When the command was given in the Exodus passage, what was emphasized is that they are to remember that God is their creator. He is unique, and there is no other God. They are his special people, and they are to worship him only. A generation later, to people who did not witness the deliverance firsthand, Moses drew their minds back to the Exodus. They are to remember the Sabbath because God is their Redeemer. He brought them up out of the land of slavery. He rescued them and chose them of all the nations in the world to be his people. Observing the Sabbath marks them as God's special people. God gave them the Sabbath not only to force them to rest and keep them from getting weary, but as a sign that they are in a covenant with him. I'm going to reread a couple passage, a couple of verses from Exodus 31. This is Exodus 31, verses 12, 13, and then 17. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, 
so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The Sabbath, we are told, is to be a sign of the covenant that they, the Israelites, will perpetually observe so that they will know and declare that God is the Lord, that he is their Lord. He is the one who created them, and he is the one who called them out of Egypt to be his own special people. Sometimes in the scriptures, there are signs associated with the covenants that God makes with his people. The sign of the covenant with Noah is the rainbow. Even today, when we see a rainbow, we can be reminded of the promise of God that he will never flood the earth again. And we also can be reminded of the importance of obedience because we remember the consequences of disobedience that befell that nation, that generation at the time of Noah. The sign of the covenant with Abraham was circumcision. All of the baby boys were to be circumcised, set apart to God to be a pure and holy people, individuals who are unique from all of the nations, who did not practice this and who were not in a covenant with God. The Sabbath is a sign of the covenant that God made with Israel through Moses. It was to be clear to them and to all nations that they were God's special people because they partook of this day of rest every week. When we see the Sabbath as the sign of the covenant, then it makes sense as to why the penalty for breaking the Sabbath was so severe. When they failed to observe the Sabbath, they were not only breaking one commandment of many, but by their actions, they are saying that their relationship with God, the covenant that they are in with God, does not matter to them. They think lightly of the sign because they think lightly of the covenant and of the one whom they are in covenant with. The nation of Israel was to keep the Sabbath, not only because it was commanded, but even more so because the Sabbath is the covenant sign. And so it was a weekly reminder that they are not just one of many people groups on the earth, but they are God's special people. God is their creator and their redeemer. They are in a covenant relationship with him. God has made this glorious, merciful covenant with them. He promises to be their God and to dwell with them. And they are reminded of that perpetually when they remember the Sabbath. Well, as we think about how we are to apply the Sabbath today, let us now turn to what Jesus taught concerning the Sabbath. What was his expectation of his followers? Our second point, Jesus and the Sabbath. One writer says, It is perhaps the Sabbath commandment that shows most clearly how Jesus transforms the law. And that is why there is so much debate and such a scope of ideas on what keeping the Sabbath or the Lord's Day looks like today. Jesus transforms the Sabbath by his words and his actions. And there are different ideas on how he transforms the Sabbath and to what degree the Sabbath commands of the Old Testament are to be applied to our experience on Sunday, which is frequently called the Lord's Day by some. As we read the Old Testament, it becomes abundantly clear that the nation of Israel failed to keep the Sabbath. They broke and denigrated the covenant that they were in with God. Eventually, the culmination of their sin and rebellion led to punishment. The northern nation of Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians, and the southern nation of Judah were taken into exile in Babylon. And as we saw last week in the command against using the Lord's name in vain, the people who returned from captivity were so afraid of disobedience that they went to the opposite extreme. To make sure that they did not misuse the Lord's name, they did not speak his name at all. To make sure that they did not break the Sabbath, they minutely defined what it meant to keep the Sabbath and what the work was that they were to avoid. By the time Jesus came on the scene, they had made the Sabbath a burden. 
that which was given to them by God for their good was onerous. The Sabbath was one of the greatest points of contention between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day. Time and again, and in all of the Gospels, and on various occasions, we read of Jesus being confronted by the religious leaders over the observance of the Sabbath. From the perspective of the Pharisees and the religious leaders, Jesus continually broke the Sabbath and encouraged others to do so. He did not keep what they defined the Sabbath rules to be. In fact, as far as they were concerned, he flaunted his disobedience to their human standards. Jesus said to those who challenged him, because he did not rebuke his disciples from plucking heads of grain, from doing what they considered to be harvesting on the Sabbath, Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. His reply reveals to us two crucial points regarding Jesus' understanding of the Sabbath. First, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. God did not first, in eternity past, devise the idea of a Sabbath and then create people in order to keep that Sabbath, making them slaves to it. God created human beings, and out of love and to develop his relationship with them, he graciously gave the Sabbath. From Jesus' perspective, his opponents had completely misunderstood what the Sabbath was about. The Sabbath was designed to foster their relationship with God, reminding them of God's goodness in creation and redemption, and what a delight and blessing it is to be his people. But instead, they had turned it into an intricate program of don'ts and do's, designed to earn God's favor, or at the very least, designed to keep God from punishing them again. They kept the Sabbath out of fear and not out of love. And second, maybe even more controversial, in his response to the religious leaders, Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. And this means that they cannot tell Jesus what is or isn't lawful on the Sabbath because he is the lawgiver. They are not in a place to determine what actions are permitted or not. Jesus, the Son of Man, is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the one who rightly and with divine authority determines what can and cannot be done on the Sabbath. For example, though they were shocked by his actions, it was appropriate for Jesus to heal on the Sabbath and to liberate one who has been in physical bondage. The healing that Jesus did in Mark 3 is not to be seen as work, which contradicts the Sabbath law, but as an act of deliverance in keeping with what the Sabbath is designed to teach them. God is the one who has and who will rescue them. God is the one of the Exodus who delivers people from bondage. And it's appropriate that Jesus delivered this man from his physical bondage on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day when they rejoice and delight in the mercy and grace of God. And Jesus came to show grace and mercy to those he ministered to. One of the many things that Jesus sought to do in his ministry was to correct the people's teaching about the Sabbath. They were not to be in bondage to the day, but the day is given for them, to them, for their blessing. The Sabbath is made for the good of God's people. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, what does that mean for us today? Our third point is the Sabbath and the New Covenant. All believers seem to agree that Jesus' teaching and his death and resurrection have transformed in some way the Sabbath commandment. But what does the transformation look like? How are we to understand it? Or to ask it another way, how much of the Sabbath regulations are transferred to the Lord's day? A strict adherence to Sabbath regulations would require keeping the Sabbath on Saturday, not Sunday. But by and large, believers have made Sunday the day of our Lord's resurrection to be the day of the week that we have set apart. Sunday is the Lord's day. Well, what continuity is there between the Sabbath as we read of it in the Old Testament 
and what we are supposed to do on Sunday. And that is why this is one of the test cases which reveals how an individual, a church, or a denomination understand the relationship between the Old and the New Testament. And that is why I'm sure that there will be different interpretations even in this room this morning. I was at a conference once where this theme came up during a panel discussion among the speakers. And one of the individuals who was applying the Old Testament principles of the Sabbath to the Lord's Day, to Sunday, believed that it was wrong to travel on Sunday, that that was disobedience. And as I listened to him, I was aware that one of the other conference speakers had a much different interpretation because he was planning on traveling the next day. Two scholarly individuals, both seminary professors, both men who love the Lord and who are seeking to be obedient to him, come to different conclusions about the Sabbath. At the very least, what this teaches us is that we need to show grace to those we disagree with. And not surprisingly, I am approaching the theme of the Sabbath from a Baptistic perspective. As a result, I think that it is helpful for us to understand what relationship we are to have with the Sabbath today by asking two questions. And these two questions are, first, is the Sabbath the covenant sign of the new covenant? And second, what do the New Testament writers say about the Sabbath? The first question, is the Sabbath the covenant sign of the new covenant? And the answer is no. If you go back to the texts from Exodus, you will see God saying things like, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath, or the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath. It is specifically to the nation of Israel that these commands were given. They are to remember the Sabbath. It was the sign of the covenant that they were in with God. Nowhere in the New Testament do we read of keeping the Sabbath or the Lord's Day or any other particular day as the covenant sign of the New Covenant. There is no New Testament list of regulations as to what one can or cannot do on the Lord's Day. In fact, the only time that the phrase the Lord's Day is mentioned in the New Testament is in Revelation 1, where we are told that it was on the Lord's Day that John had a vision. The writer of Hebrews, who especially focuses on the New Covenant and how it is better than the Old Covenant, only mentions the word Sabbath once. In the entire letter or sermon that is the book of Hebrews, the word Sabbath occurs just one time. And we'll get to the context of how he uses it later. But it's not to teach that the Sabbath is the enduring covenant sign. And so when we think about how do we relate to the Sabbath, the Sabbath command today? We need to recognize that the Sabbath is not the sign of the new covenant. Well, if it's not the new covenant sign, then what is? In the Great Commission, the disciples are told to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is emphasized because it is a sign of the new covenant. It pictures the work of Jesus Christ in the life of a believer, that we have died with Christ to our old way of living, and we have been raised with him to a new life, a life of faith. Those in the Old Testament were not told to be baptized, but those in the New Testament are. We enter into the new covenant by faith in Jesus. And baptism is an expression of saving faith. When an individual is baptized, they are making a public declaration that they have repented of their sins, they have turned from their old way, and that they have faith in the saving power of Jesus Christ. They are declaring that they have entered into this new covenant with God through Christ. In addition, there's another sign of the new covenant the Lord's table. When Jesus passed the cup, he said, 
This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Jesus sacrificed himself. He gave up his life on the cross. His body was broken and his blood was shed. And the sacrifice of the covenant is symbolized in the bread and the cup. And Jesus commanded that we are to partake the Lord's table in remembrance of him, in remembrance of what he did on the cross, in remembrance and recognition of the fact that we need his sacrifice to cleanse us of our sins, that it is only by his offering up of himself as the Lamb of God that we can enter into this new covenant relationship with the Father. These covenant signs are prompts to remember, to remember God's mercy, to remember our need of him, to remember the promises that he has made to us and how we are to live for him. These covenant signs are a blessing to us. They're a commitment on our part to remember what God has done for us and that we are going to live for him, a life of faith in this world. When we eat of the elements, we are confessing that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord and that we are in a covenant relationship with God through him. Like the Sabbath, these are observances which are rich in meaning and full of blessing. These are the signs of the new covenant. The covenant that God makes with people from every tongue, tribe, and nation in Christ. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these put us into a posture of humility as those who are aware that we are recipients of God's great grace and mercy. They remind us that we are in a covenant with God and we are to live in light of our relationship with him. So the first question, is the Sabbath a sign of the new covenant? And then the second question, what do the New Testament writers say about the Sabbath? And listen to a couple of passages from the writings of the Apostle Paul. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Paul writes, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And then Romans 14, 5 and 6. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor to, of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. See, Paul was trying to help direct the church in all sorts of practical matters. And it was a difficult job because the church was made up of Jewish background believers and Gentile background believers. And they both had their ideas about what worshiping God looked like. And they're trying to worship God together. Those who had a Jewish background, in their understanding, it would be impossible to think of a framework of obedience to God that did not include the Sabbath. However, the idea of the Sabbath was foreign to the Gentiles. And so the question that they were wrestling with was how much of the Old Testament law and practices were the Gentiles to embrace to become Christians, or at least to be godly. Well, Paul is clear, for example, in the letter to the Galatians, that they do not need to be circumcised. The covenant sign with Abraham, which all of Abraham's physical descendants, all of the Jews were to participate in, is not required for Abraham's spiritual descendants. Men and women from all nations who come to God through Jesus by faith, circumcision was not required for them and their families. And Paul says in these passages I read earlier that the commemorating of days, including the Sabbath, is also a matter of Christian liberty. That those in the New Covenant do not need to keep all of the Sabbath regulations 
that we read of in the Old Testament. It is something they can do if they want, but it is not essential. If you want to celebrate the Sabbath, then do so in faithfulness to the Lord, giving thanks to him. If you do not want to celebrate the Sabbath, then honor the Lord in that. But above all, put on love. Whatever you do, show love and charity to your brother and sister in the Lord. And so let us bring it all together in our fourth point. The Sabbath principles for today. One writer says, most of us adopt an attitude towards Sunday that is either directly inherited from our upbringing or it is in reaction to the upbringing. And I think that's a very true statement. We have all grown up with expectations of what is and what isn't permitted on Sunday. And we either abide by these traditions and think that they are expressions of obedience and faithfulness to the Lord, or as we get older, we have grown to resist them and turn from them. But what does the scripture say? And I would suggest that part of the reason why the Sabbath issue is so thorny is because the Sabbath was designed to accomplish multiple purposes for the people of Israel. And when we think about how we are to apply the Sabbath today and what principles we are to apply today, let us think about three different purposes of the Sabbath. And the first is that the Sabbath is a covenant sign. It was the sign of the covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And we are not part of that covenant. The new covenant has different signs. What the Sabbath teaches us is the importance of observing the covenant signs of the new covenant, baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are both expressions of faith and do what the Sabbath did in that they are signs of remembrance. They draw our minds to our God, to his great mercy, to the work of Jesus Christ that was accomplished on the cross. They teach us what it means to be in relationship with him and the value and the beauty and the preciousness of knowing Jesus. And so we are to prioritize and value and view as precious the signs of the covenant. That's the first purpose of the Sabbath. Second, the Sabbath as a time of rest. The Sabbath very practically provided a pattern of work and rest for the people. It highlights the reality that we need regular times of physical rest. We are not created with the ability to work perpetually. We require weekly rest, and we also remember that there was a Sabbath year, every seventh year, which the nation of Israel were to remember, which teaches that at times we need extended periods of rest. This is good. This is how God made us. We have limits. And we dishonor our Creator by ignoring our limits and ignoring this idea of rest that he instituted in the Sabbath. The Sabbath principle of rest is one that we are to abide by. However, the picture of Sabbath rest does not just point to our need of physical rest in the present, but to eternal rest. And that is the context in which the writer to Hebrews uses the word Sabbath that I mentioned earlier. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And this is a topic in and of itself that definitely could be the subject of an additional sermon. But the point is, the Sabbath of the Old Testament looks forward to the ultimate Sabbath rest that there will be in Jesus. Jesus, the one who fulfills the law and the prophets. This idea of Sabbath, this idea of rest at the end of a time of work, teaches us that at the end of this age, there will be an eternal Sabbath rest in Jesus. 
That's how he fulfills this idea of Sabbath. See, the rest that the people of Israel had in the promised land was not the be-all and end-all of God's plan. It looked forward to, it anticipated a future rest. And the eternal rest is not going to be boring and characterized by inactivity. You know, sometimes we think of rest and a little bit of rest is good. But a perpetual experience of rest sounds tedious and not that exciting. But the reason why heaven is called our rest is because it's the place where the struggle will be over. There will be no more curse, no more tears, no more pain. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, The ground was cursed. Work became difficult. They were to work before the curse. And before the curse, work was a delight. And so in that sense, heaven is going to be an eternal rest. We will still work, but our work will be a joy, a delight. It will be not afflicted by the curse that came upon the world in Genesis 3. The Sabbath as a time of rest. It teaches us that we need rest in the present and we are to have weekly times of rest. And it teaches us and points to and anticipates the eternal rest in Christ. And then thirdly, the third purpose of the Sabbath, the Sabbath and the priority of worship. The Sabbath was given to the Israelites to provide for them a regular time of collective worship. And what does the New Testament teach us about worship. And first, we learn that our lives as individuals, as believers, are to be lived in a state of constant worship. Now, that does not mean that we are to always be singing praise songs, but it means that we are to always function with an awareness of God and the privilege of being his blood-bought children. Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He says that we are to offer up our bodies, all that we are, the entirety of our lives, to God as spiritual worship. That's what worshiping God means. It's not just what we do when we assemble as a congregation. It's not just singing songs, although that's included in it. It's living with an awareness that we are God's people, that there is a God in heaven who lives and rules and reigns, and that he is our Father who has loved us and sent his Son to die for our sins. And so all of our life is to be lived in a way that expresses our understanding of that. Remember what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter uh, chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no... And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's another way of saying that he lives his life as an act of worship to God because he lives it by faith. In addition, the Sabbath teaches us the importance of collective worship. We are to worship the Lord together. The Sabbath wasn't just that the individuals were to celebrate it. No, it was a time where they were to, together, remember God, remember his mercy, remember he is the redeemer and the creator. And this aspect of the Sabbath is most definitely repeated in the New Testament. We are told that we are not to forsake the assembling together. And there are an abundance of reasons why we are to prioritize regular congregational worship. Practical reasons, spiritual reasons, biblical reasons, The church, 
the local congregation is to be very important in our lives. We help one another grow. We are blessed by praising God together. We teach each other. When we assemble, there are opportunities to serve one another and to use our spiritual gifts. And even though there are people in the congregation or people, other believers who it's not as easy to get along with, well, those are important relationships as well. That gives us the opportunity to express love and kindness and patience and so forth. So many benefits and blessings with being part of the congregation. And we think of what the Sabbath teaches and the purposes of the Sabbath. But one of them is to draw God's people together in worship of Him and so that we might encourage one another in the Lord. The Sabbath principle of worship is most definitely upheld. And as Jesus does with the other command, it's intensified. The book title, and then there were nine, is not a fair title. No one is saying that the teaching on the Sabbath is irrelevant. I hope no one's saying that. The reality is, there is none other of the Ten Commandments that has undergone a transformation like the Sabbath commandment when we come to the New Covenant. Well, may we all be students of the scripture. May we realize the importance of the principles of rest and worship. May we think about what it means to be in the new covenant. And if you have not yet expressed personal faith, saving faith, if you have not yet repented of your sins and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, then come to him turn to him. He is the way by which we enter into the new covenant. The covenant in which there are eternal and glorious and amazing promises of God. May we all look for hope in Jesus and anticipate the future Sabbath rest which will endure forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the teaching of your word. And our Father, we thank you for the teaching of the Sabbath and what it teaches us about covenants and covenant signs and that these covenant signs are a remembrance of who you are and what you have done for us and the blessing and glory of being your people. And our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath principles of rest and worship. And our Father, we pray that these would be integrated into our lives. And our Father, that we would would recognize the importance of being faithful to you. Our Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for, uh, for this word. And our Father, help us to live it out for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. And may God's peace be upon you.